Brilliant. Welcome back. So uh, you've heard our recruitment pitch there. And if that is of, uh, of interest to you, um, please, as we've said said along the way, do visit the floor platform. Our uh, recruitment and HR team are, have, a, have a booth in the floor platform. You can have a chat with them. Uh, but as, as we discussed, it's not necessarily about us, this conference. And in the first video, um, in case uh, you missed it, um, Matt Eggers from Breakthrough Energy Ventures, he obviously talked about uh, how they look at investments and look very closely at the amount of uh, carbon that can be removed and there's, there's big goals for that um, but clearly a key aspect of what they want to do is also make money and that sets us up very very nicely for our for our next panel we need you need a return on investment so how do we take these technologies how do we develop the r d to get them to the place where they are ready as graham was talking about and how do we then get them through to commercialization um, and we're really fortunate to have a, a brilliant um, moderator. I'm delighted to say we've got uh, manufacturing technology expert Katie Milne, who has recently taken on a new role as hydrogen director at the High Value Manufacturing Catapult. Well, welcome, Katie. Thanks very much, Dominic. And you, you also spent um, 10 years as, um, uh, at the manufacturing technology catapult and, and you've, you, know, you, you also were a key lead in the uh, Fly Zero project. So very well placed to discuss this with our panel. And if you wouldn't mind, I'll hand over to you to introduce our panel. Yes, yeah, thanks very much. So we're, we're going to run a panel now on, um, on supercharging R&D, research and development and commercialization. Um, as Dominic said, my name's Katie Milne and I'm chairing today. I'm the program director at the High Value Manufacturing Catapult for, for Hydrogen. And we are a, a centre based in the United Kingdom that covers a cluster of seven different um, translational research centres. And we work a lot with aerospace and, and companies like Zero Avia as well. Um, and we've got three people on the panel from uh, three different nations who I'm I'm excited to introduce. So we've got um, Sophie Lane, who has uh, suffered me in the past um, in, in, in working together in the Aerospace Technology Institute. So Sophie is the Chief Relationships Officer at the ATI. I'll come back in a minute. I'll just introduce everyone on the panel and then I'll come back for some um, remarks if that's okay. So um, Sophie Lane's Chief Relationship Officer at the ATI. Um, she's responsible for the funding R&D in the sector's overarching tech, that organisation is responsible for the overarching technology strategy in the UK and for funding R&D. And Sophie's got 15 plus years experience in central government, defence, security and trade um, and has now been in the ATI for for nearly a year, I guess. So, so, so and I remember um, I was the, I was on secondment there when she started on Fly Zero. Uh, we have Ron Van Manen, who is head of strategic development at Clean Aviation, formerly Clean Sky, which is the EU joint undertaking with industry to fund R and D in sustainable aviation. Um, Ron has been with Clean Sky for over a decade now, following a career in both KLM and British Airways. And then we also have Robert Toff, Robin Toff. Robin, this is the first time I think I've met you. I've met Sophie and, and Ron before. And Robin's the lead director at, for aerospace at the Washington State's Department of Commerce. And she's worked in economic development in Washington State for nearly 20 years after a career started in engineering and technology. I mean, they're never, I don't think, in my career, which has not been so long yet, I'd like to think, but there's never been a time where aerospace has been so exciting. So every two years, the Aerospace Technology Institute runs a conference. They just had a very successful conference two weeks ago. But I remember standing up two years before, so in the, in the previous conference, and saying to everybody, you know, I joined aerospace. Uh, and I've been somewhat disappointed, honestly, because it had been incremental development all the way through the 80s, 90s and noughties. But all of a sudden, you know, in the late 2010s, there's been a flourishing of activity around new technology. Um, and I think, you know, at activities like Clean Sky and um, the Aerospace Technology Institute programme have, have, have affected that. Um, but it's really exciting now to see urban air mobility, innovation in hydrogen, innovation on sustainable aviation fuels. And, and with the long pull through times in aviation and the big barriers to entry, I'm hoping to have a really good panel conversation today about how public and private investment can support development and what they what you guys see as the route through to, uh, to commercialization and making these things a reality. 
Um, so I'm just going to go around the panel and ask everybody to um, give a few initial opening remarks and thoughts one at a time, and then we'll have some um, Q and A led by me, and then I'll I'll look I'll start to look at the the Q and A in the chat for the last kind of fifteen minutes, if if that's okay with everybody. Um, so Sophie, let's start with you. You're on the top of my list. Um, would you like to give us some some opening thoughts? Yeah, thank you very much, Katie. And, you know, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to really start by looking at the UK specifically and what we're doing here to support technical innovation, but also um, how that is evolving. Um, and I think a lot of this will uh, link to the previous panel. So uh, whoever did the order has obviously thought about it very well, because uh, there was a lot that I was agreeing with, uh, with the previous panelists. Um, so I'm from the Aerospace Technology Institute. Um, we are the organization within the UK that is co-funded uh, by the Department for Business and also Industry. And we're funded over the next three years to the tune of £685 million. Pounds. Um, and with the co-funding, that leads to somewhere in the region of £1.3 billion. Um, what we do with that money is we invest it in um, R&D in aerospace, specifically related to uh, net zero goals. And we look very much um, around uh, return, obviously, to the UK, but also how we can help to uh, stimulate the market, how we can help to support um, the industry to grow and those innovations to come through, particularly um, at the moment in the zero carbon space. Um, so it's a sign of the government commitment um, to the requirement to fund aerospace R&D. But it's also really interesting that um, increasingly this is a highly competitive area and there is a, a very large demand for that funding. And so what we're having to look at is how we can evolve uh, the way that we work with industry and also uh, the way that we support um, uh, people coming into industry. You talked about the high barriers to entry. How can we help to bring those down to support some of the smaller companies alongside some of the more established OEMs and to make sure that these innovative technologies, particularly in the hydrogen space and in the zero carbon space, get through into the market as quickly as possible because that's the best way uh, that we can get to our net zero goals. So a few things that we um, are doing specifically, um, we've just launched uh, uh, we call it the hub, it's very catchy, um, but essentially what we're trying to do is to create a space that facilitates um, conversation, discussion, uh, investment potentially, and also um, collaboration between and across sectors and for new entrants into sectors and to allow the larger companies to understand what's going on in the smaller companies and to help bring down some of those barriers to entry. We're also um, looking at how we can collaborate across borders. Uh, this is a global problem and the vast majority of the companies involved are global. So how can we work uh, with others? Where should we be collaborating and where should we be competing uh, is a really interesting question and one I suspect we might get into uh, later on. But also we're looking at um, uh, what the balance of public-private financing might look like, um, what the difference is uh, in investor appetite in different parts of the world, how we can help stimulate that here in the UK. Um, and then in addition, what are those areas of directed R&D that we could get involved with to help the industry to move forward and to answer some of the questions that perhaps by themselves they wouldn't be able to answer. And the Fly Zero project that you mentioned earlier is a great example of that and a really innovative way of looking at um, a really complicated uh, question. So I guess I'll leave it there and then um, we can come back to any of or all of that. Amazing. Thank you very much, Sophie. And yeah, really nice to hear about some of the things reflected back at me that have been happening in the ATI that I've had the privilege to be a part of myself. Thank you very much for the invitation um, and the nice introduction, Katie. 
My name is Robin Toth. As Katie said, I've been in my position at the state of Washington for about four years. And I will say that aviation has changed dramatically even in the last four years. Um, traditionally, I had been working in the commercial aviation um, environment. And so as soon as I started, SAP has been around in Washington State for a long time, but we started to look at these new types of aircraft, whether it was electric or hydrogen or hybrid, and so it's been a really interesting period of time. We've worked with several companies to help them what we call land in Washington. So really excited about the potential for some of those companies and really happy to see my friends from uh, Universal Hydrogen on this call as well and Zero Avia. We're really focused um, some of you may know that Washington State considers ourselves one of the greenest states in the United States. Definitely. We have an electric portfolio that is 96% plus carbon free. So being able to create sustainable aviation and fuel, um, looking at these new electric aircraft types and whether you have a hybrid or a fully hydrogen propelled aircraft, we think that we can be an important player. We have over a hundred years of legacy, um, but we really are looking to the future. And we're looking not just in our manufacturing arena, but we're also looking at that in our educational arena and in our legislative arena. We have a number of our elected officials who are very interested in aviation and aerospace. And so they're helping us develop a portfolio of requests that we're going to take to the state next year to help us propel the work that we're doing a bit faster. Instead of taking a traditional pathway, maybe we can accelerate some of the work we're doing. So I'm really excited to hear more about what Sophie's doing in the UK and what Ron is doing in Europe, because, you know, uh, imitation is the best form of flattery. And if there are new things that we can see and that we can engage in, I want to make sure that we're leading that charge in Washington. Amazing. Thank you, Robin. Ron, do you want to try again? See if. Uh... Can you hear me, Katie? Yay. Yes. Excellent. We can Great. You. Thank you. And thank you for having this opportunity. And, and, and hi to all in that sense. Um, where to start? I mean, clean aviation, for those who don't know it, is indeed the successor to the two Clean Sky Partnerships. So it's a public-private partnership funded within the EU's framework programs. Uh, we're a four billion program in total over roughly a decade. Uh, that's nowhere near enough. We need contributions from the ATI. We need contributions from other national programs. We, I think, also need to recognize this is a global industry. So it's actually great to be in a panel when we're when we're looking you know, across the pond as well, because I think that that's something not said, but we we should acknowledge in that sense. Our four billion is 1.7 of EU public funding, so it's more than matched by the by the industry that's eligible. And we've launched a first call. This is a grant-based mechanism, uh, and we'll run for roughly a decade. Uh, we believe. I totally agree with you, Katie. This is uh, maybe comparable to the 1930s or something like that, but or the 1920s. Uh, Hopefully now this disruption, this revolution in aviation won't mean that the inventors are the pilots and they kill themselves flying their aircraft. That, that, that's, that's, I think we're beyond that, but this is by far the most exciting decade uh, that I've uh, experienced in, uh, well, in a career in which I tr had gray hair and then lost my hair. So uh, if that says something, I think it, it is an exciting time. We also see and we need it, let's face it, we need uh, talent to, to come to this industry and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll succeed in getting aeronautics uh, yeah, really high on the agenda in terms of young people um, from both genders, from all walks of life and, uh, and to fill the talent base in that end. Our strategy is to, in technical terms, skip a generation. Uh, if if uh, Brian Moran, who I, uh, a good friend of mine from Airbus, uh, if he were here or any of my other friends at Boeing were here, would be saying, you know, we have a wonderful track record of 15 to 20% every generation of new aircraft. 
Uh, but if we're growing at 5% a year, we actually think that's more like three to three and a half between now and 2050. Uh, but even then, you know, that, that, that buys you time, but it doesn't break the trend. It doesn't decouple economic activity or growth from uh, climate warming or, or you know, greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to mo much more radically and fundamentally break that. And break that means breakthroughs. And uh, quite, quite cool to hear breakthrough energy in the in the break in that sense because i think and i'll return to that that's something that i think also can nicely complement the public intervention and the, you know, the the routine investment in that sense we want to skip a generation meaning we think the next aircraft that we're helping the industry to develop at a research level uh will be more to like 30 to 50 percent better technically speaking uh, we also need to recognize that the, even that's not enough we need to go to a different energy source so you know Trailblazers like Zero Avia and others, I think, are a necessary ingredient in looking at things that are non-drop-in, non-standard, that, that 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 look at different ways of doing things, and and you know are are willing to challenge the established order. But this is an incredibly difficult industry to do that. Uh, we think that the you know look at the long haul, medium haul, short haul, regional commuter, sub commuter. Uh, the revolution will start probably at the the smaller end. There's no no offense, I hope, taken in that sense, but it uh, uh, that's where it's easier to implement uh, you know, really disruptive technologies. We also think if you look at the the installed base in the aviation industry, you know, I, I doubt somebody is going to come up with an aircraft which is 30% better than the 787 Dreamliner or the A350 within the next decade. I doubt anybody has the capital, the, the, the deep pockets to do so, or the customer service and the, the product support to do that. But you know, at the commuter and at the regional and at the single aisle side of the market, uh, that's really ripe for clean sheet and for some disruptive thinking. And so we, you know, we really encourage that. Uh, and we make no apologies for that. You know, we're not looking at urban air uh, mobility as a program. Doesn't mean we don't think it'll happen. You know, we'll, we'll, you know, we, we, we wish everybody luck who's investing in that. Uh, but there's a lot of private capital, uh, you know, uh, in in that area. Uh, that's a wash with, uh, with with investors. We don't think the world is ready for disruption at the long haul, large twin aisle level. But right in the middle, that's where I think the action is, and that's where you know we can we can really make a a huge step. Um, but the huge step in a short term is still probably a decade away from from product introduction. And politically speaking, that's probably one, that's our Achilles heel. That's where, where the industry needs to accept that we, you know, we can do things, we can replace the current aircraft with generation you know, Max Neo 787. Um, I absolutely support a rapid and, and, and um, you know, really uh, aggressive ramp up of sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, but I think that's a midterm measure. I, I actually think that is, but this industry, in this industry, midterm is probably 30 to 50 years. But I even think that's a midterm measure. So the kind of things that are uh, that are happening are going to be, we think, first commuter, single aisle air, level aircraft, um, and fuel cells, hydrogen, hydrogen as a, as a as an energy source, and how we deal with that. The big question mark is not only how we get there in time and how will the market develop in terms of different networks, different operating uh, yeah, concept of operations. Where do we get the energy? Because this is not an easy game and others will be looking for it as well. So maybe we'll have time to, to look at that later. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ron. I think there's two things that I'd be quite keen to explore in a discussion with, with the three of you. The, the first is a, around kind of um, collaboration models and how you bring in public private investment and and how you work differently and then the second is more about international collaboration you know we have some of the great aerospace players globally on the phone here how what things can we do at an international and, and global level level I suppose so so we, if we start on the first one which is like the the ways of working the ways to support industry and the ways of bringing in additional funding because Ron as you said it like we can't go for the bigger aircraft perhaps because there's not deep enough pockets, but then again, you know, whose pockets are we raiding? Because there, there is money in the world. Um, so so perhaps like if I can come all the way around back to you, Sophie, what are your thoughts on kind of on 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 the ways of working and how how we could work with uh, private finance? Yeah, I mean, so uh, firstly, I'd say that I agree kind of wholeheartedly with what Ron said. You know, there isn't 
nobody's got enough money to do this by themselves. So collaboration is the obvious answer. You know, we need to think about how we work in partnership. We need to think how, about how we use that partnership uh, effectively. We need to think about those areas where we are prepared to share. And that might mean uh, approaching IP relationships differently. It might mean having um, a very different approach to risk. Um, and globally, that might mean um, some, some culture shift um, uh, to get to a point where we're talking the same language. Um, I think from um, the public private financing, you know, I think there is at the moment clearly, and I'm sure it's been talked about already during this summit, um, a pressure on uh, public finances. Um, there's a cost of living crisis, there is an energy crisis, there is a war in Europe. Um, you know, all of that is putting pressure on the public purse. And in addition, we're asking for some of the biggest innovation and biggest investment that's been asked for, uh, probably in the entirety of, of the aerospace um, uh, lifetime. So, you know, we're looking for huge amounts of investment. There are investors out there. Um, they look for slightly different things. And, you know, what we need to think about is how can we talk about return on investment? How can we um, catalyze and work with investors who are very interested in the green agenda particularly? Um, but how can we also ensure that uh, we're not asking them uh, to take unnecessary risks? And that is going to require us to think a bit differently in terms of... Um, the innovation institutions and, and the research organizations uh, in terms of how we support, but also it's asking industry to think differently about what they are asking for and how what they're prepared to give for that. And I think that is a, a journey we need to go through. Um, but there is, you know, there's a huge amount of disruption in the market at the moment it's perfectly possible that some things we might have required some of the larger companies to do in the past is not going to happen without additional support. And so we need to think um, collaboratively about how we approach that. And we also need to learn from each other because I don't think we have enough time to let uh, you know one side of the globe do it one way and succeed and the other side to experiment on something else. We can't afford to be duplicating efforts and we can't really be afford to not be learning from each other consistently and, and uh, working collectively towards the goal. I think, yeah, I think what you're expressing is a real tension between like this is an existential threat. We, if we don't fix this, we won't be able to fly. We're harming our planet versus like kind of almost nationalistic protectionism of, of you, you know, that some of that dynamic there. I mean, Robin, Ron, do you want to add anything? And, you know, what, what, one of the places that Sophie took my head was, was thinking of other countries, you know, you've got these very fast developing nations like South Korea, for example, and you have um, also the, the Middle East where they've got monster sovereign wealth funds and they're looking mm -hmm. to diversify away from all, like, do you have any, any thoughts about how we can, we can leverage that, but still, you know, maintain, I guess, the you, you kind of regional strengths in, in aerospace. Robin, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I was just going to say, you know, we're, as the, you know, a state in the U S we, focus mostly internally, although we do know that a lot of the economic issues around the world are affecting us. So we take that very seriously and we do work um, with um, our, region, our national and international partners to ensure that we're understanding what those trigger points are in other countries. We have representation in Asia, in the UK, in Europe. So they're helping us to understand what's going on. What are the efforts that we can undertake? We try to be a good partner in that respect. We also focus um, in our state because as I said before, we consider ourselves the evergreen state. That's actually our motto. And so we're very, very focused on ensuring that both or all of the elements that are important to our 
um, citizens are as clean as they could be, whether it's our water, whether it's our air. And so that is a huge focus for us. And how do we continue that? We don't want any additional pollution coming out of any of our sectors. So we make sure that we're focused on creating new technologies that are gonna take us into the future. And one of the things that recently occurred in Washington, DC, the head of our government is they created this concept of the hydrogen hub. And they invested $7 billion into this hub. And we are applying as a state along with one of our neighboring states and could include other neighboring states um, to be considered one of those seven to 10 hydrogen hubs. We feel like we have a really great chance because as I said before, our, electric our electricity portfolio is about 96% carbon free. We use solar, we use wind, we use water power, we use some additional types of power that help us create that clean electricity grid. And that is seen very positively uh, to some of the companies that we're working with who are dealing with, you know, electric aviation or hydrogen or hybrid. So we find that that is one of the key elements. If we were in a different state, maybe we wouldn't have the attention that we do. And of course, with our 100 year legacy or plus of aviation expertise, you know, we're trying to bring all these things together. I think that most of our sectors are more aligned than we are um, separate. We actually have a slide that we use which shows all the intersections. You know, aviation isn't a standalone. We also work with clean energy. We also work with information technology. We work with our creative economy. We work with our um, life sciences, you know, keeping your aircraft as clean as possible. That's a real intersection with our life sciences. So we find that we have more in common and we even have more in common with our friends in other countries as well. We're all fighting the same thing. I think Sophie described all those issues we have and we all have them, whether we're a country or a state or a city, we're all trying to figure that out. And there's not enough money in the world to help at everything that we need to do. But I think the partnerships that we're creating are really important. Thanks, Robin. Ron, do you want to add in just briefly? I'm, I'm beginning to clock watch a little bit now in the session. Yeah, yeah. First of all, because you mentioned things like sovereign wealth uh, and others, um, at the risk of being a bit controversial or, or, or contrarian, uh, I'm not convinced, you know, if there's I don't know, between five and 10 billion apparently in private equity floating around in urban air mobility. I, I don't think there's a lack of capital for the aeronautical or the aviation industry per se. I do think just looking at the, uh, let's say the whole spectrum of long haul, you know, twin aisle aircraft down to um, general aviation, um, the, the technology isn't there for, for something that would make a big, uh, you know, that really move the needle in, in, in long haul uh, aviation. So we should do what we can do. And what people don't realize, I come across this every day, is that two thirds of aviation emissions are on flights below 2000 miles, two thirds of it. And one third actually below around 800 miles. So, and what I often encounter in Brussels is the, um, I think, you know, Again, I'm being a little bit provocative, somewhat naive uh, comment that, uh, well, we'll just put people on trains. Uh, you know, that's not going to happen with the exception of a couple of hundred city pairs. Uh, it, it, aviation is not only essential and it will, you know, people will demand mobility, but, but you know, societies, people will demand short haul aviation mobility as well. So we, you know, we might as well, you know, recognize that's going to happen. And as the state minister for environment in Norway told me a few weeks ago, we also need to recognize there's another issue, which is biodiversity and impact over the life cycle. And if you want to, you know, uh, basically put track down over the entire planet, that's not going to be very prudent either. Uh, you know, aviation is wonderful. It's yeah, 2,000 meters of a takeoff strip and 2,000 meters of a landing strip, and there's virtually no noise in the middle. There's no infrastructure in the middle, uh, but we need to solve the energy equation. So we we are convinced, if you like, that that is where you know where we're, where where we need to go. 
and why we need to look at the short and the medium ranges uh, first. Uh, we also are convinced that it needs a public-private partnership approach because we're not going to get there without building a business case that gets everybody on board. I'll stop there, Katie, because you're going to be looking at your watch. Excellent. So, so I'm going to ask one more question of the group, yeah. and then I'm going to take some questions from the from the Q and A. Um, so my next question is around. You know, we've got. The US, the UK, the EU represented here on the phone. Like, if you were to um, imagine that you're in a room talking about what transnational collaborations you could put together, whether that's international or even global activities, what do you think is on the table? What are the things that we can collaborate on in internationally in order to accelerate, you know, the decarbonisation of flight? So I'm going to mix it up. Robin, do you have any thoughts? Sorry to come to you first. It's such a big question. I can see your face going like, oh, no. Um, <laughs> well, well, like I, I said, we do try to, you know, get outside of our own state. But as we work with our representatives around the world, we know it's important. And there's always opportunities for us to connect with others, um, you know, where you both are Sophie and Ron, and even in Asia, Australia, we do trade missions all the time. And the trade missions aren't just, people think they're kind of what we would call a boondoggle or like a vacation. Those trade missions are not a vacation, I will tell you. It's like eight to 10 days of 20 hour meetings um, with multiple um, folks who are engaged in the same type of um, work that we're engaged in. And so we, we learn from each other. And it's not, you know, it's not combative or anything like that. It's more collaborative. And so we're taking things that we're hearing that are going on in other places of, in the world and trying to integrate them into what we're doing. We feel that having a, sing, a similar platform is going to help us achieve these issues we have. We're very concerned about pollution, you know, wherever it is. And so having global partners is really the way that we're going to make a difference. Yeah, and I think with our big move online, one of the things that you miss is those learning points, right? That you really get when you go up to a thing and you touch it. And perhaps we need to get get a bit, bit back to international travel. Um, Sophie? Yeah, so I think... Um... For me, how do we have a conversation internationally that allows us to put our national concerns to one side, that allows us to take that global concern to align around a vision, to agree enough about what it is we want to do together, that we don't get caught up in the politics, that we can look beyond that um and you know i mean the obvious one rom would be brexit but you know how do we get to a place where we can do something together to move the dial to support the industry and what they're trying to do and i think it was robin who said you know this isn't just the aerospace industry this is an aviation problem this is an energy problem there are a huge number of players here and at the global level, if we're really serious about international collaboration, if we're really serious about moving the dial, for me, it's about finding those areas where bringing together some joint programs is really going to allow us to move forward. But I think that requires a real change in the way that traditionally uh, we have approached international collaboration, because normally we're looking to secure what we can for our own country or for our own area. And actually, I think we need to be thinking differently and saying, this is the problem we want to solve. How can we come together around that? And it may well be that we can create a win-win, but it might not be a total win-win for all of us. And are we prepared to do that? And that's the thing that I think it's a mindset, Katie, that really needs to be overcome. I think that's true as well within industry and industry to industry, but, but for the international collaboration, if we were going to pull together some uh, joint funding, if we were going to do something really substantial, I think we'd have to be ambitious and I think we'd have to be willing um, to take a risk that at the moment I'm not sure I necessarily see the appetite for. 
Yeah, agreed. I mean, if I'm if I'm going to be provocative or specific, you know, are we going to collaborate on um, kind of emission standards? <clears throat> I think we might with what we do already through ICAO. Are we going to collaborate on certification? Are we going to put in like transnational programs of the type like clean aviation that bridge across countries? Are we going to launch a moonshot together as a country? And I don't actually mean a moonshot. I mean, like as a, you know, could, could Europe and America collaborate on a new, bigger zero carbon aeroplane by bigger, I mean, into that narrow body size, you know, so what, like, there's, there's so many things we could do, but we need to kind of, yes, as you said, completely reframe in, in order to do that, probably. It, it depends on, it depends on whether you can agree a joint objective. And at the moment, there are different objectives in different parts of the globe. And so whilst we might all agree that the target of net zero is a valuable one, we're all approaching it in a slightly different way. And, you know, that is that is more obvious, I guess, with the um, kind of are you moving towards mandates or are you moving towards incentives? But but it also flows into um, investor appetite, risk appetite. It flows into what um, is being funded and what isn't, where the priorities are. And, and really to overcome that, we need to have a joint objective. And if that is about accelerating the entry into service of some of these really disruptive zero emission aircraft, then that could be something that would pull together the type of initiative you're talking about. But unless you're looking to accelerate what's already going to happen, you're going to struggle to get the public part of that um, incentivizing the market in that way. Hey, Ron, would you like to pitch in on this? And if anybody's, there's a couple of questions in the chat, but if there's any more, we've got five, 10 minutes after this for, for questions, then sure, please, please sure. type them in. Well, sometimes I think we we overthink this in terms of whether, you know, at, at the state level or the public level, uh, you know, think things need to be steered or nudged or mandated or, uh, uh, you know, our industry is global. And, and if I mean industry, I'm, I'm kind of talking around the aeronautical side, but it serves not only glo global customers, but customers that are operating globally. You board a KLM flight, it's also a Delta flight number. Uh, if you're boarding a Lufthansa flight, it's a United flight number. I think, you know, we 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 do at the airline and, and even at the traveling public level i think i think there is a lot more in common than uh, than than what divides us uh you know competition is healthy it brings us further than and di di disagreement particularly at the scientific level tends to bring us further than group thinking uh you know, I, I wouldn't you know kind of go so far and and and, and quote michael douglas on greed is good but competition certainly is good uh, and and you know uh, to, to in, in in Robin's uh, geography competition looking for invest you know, uh, attracting investment uh, building jobs building innovation happens between the 50 contiguous states and it happens between 27 member states in Europe and there's nothing inherently wrong with that uh, what is nice is to think that our you know the sector actually is is looking at this we work very closely with Avia which is a GE company and Safran. They are incredibly closely connected to GE in the US. So there's a lot that happens that we tend to forget if we're over-focused on, um, on the subsidies, on the grants, on, on the mechanisms. Uh, and let's give our industry credit that that actually happens. What we need is consistency of purpose, and we need a consistency in terms of kind of a funding stream. And that has broken down from time to time. Uh, and I think that is, that is what really what, what, would, what would help you know, if, we, if we realize that that is the case. Sophie, I'm just going to, uh, Katie, sorry, I'm just going to jump in and say that we've got, yeah. um, we've got yeah. maybe a couple more minutes to get into a couple of questions, um, and then, then I think we should wrap up the panel and, and move on to the next one. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to hand over to you back for those audience questions. Awesome. Thanks very much, Dominic. Um, so there's a couple of questions on financing. Uh, one of them is a little bit beyond me, but it talks about um, in like investors and the type of investment that's offered and the relationship between where like like how much equity it is versus how much investment at the right stage in the aircraft cycle you know what like have you seen that your funding which is often public funding has helped to overcome that complement that and move the dial um and then there's a very specific question ron for you which is about um, responding to your comment which is we should go after the the middle of the market saying you know the, there like there has been a backing away from that regional market of the big primes in in the last 10 20 years and 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 how do you see that playing out so perhaps if we can go around sophie and robin on the 
on the private investment and finish on Ron and then I'll come come to closing remarks if that's okay so um Sophie on like how how can your effort how have you seen that complementing um private funding yeah so I mean we've definitely seen it complementing and I know that um some companies find that to have had some level of government backing um increases um their viability from a, a private investor point of view um and I guess the challenge with that is clearly we can't fund everybody uh and it is highly competitive as I said at the beginning but um that absolutely um anecdotally uh that helps um what we try to do is um, we're also talking a lot with the financial markets to understand what they're looking for. Um, and there is a real appetite to invest in greener projects. And I think the biggest problem that we found is a lack of understanding of the aerospace sector, um, the uncertainty over some of the technologies we're talking about, the uncertainty over some of the impacts and timescales makes uh, investors nervous. Um, and we found that there's a difference there, particularly more nervous in Europe um, than perhaps in the US. Um, we've just actually put out a paper. Uh, maybe I'll just kind of give a plug for the paper uh, that's on public private financing uh, that we launched at our conference last week, which goes into all of this and starts to bring out what might companies need to do or think about in order to increase their um, attractiveness versus other sectors which are more certain and therefore tend to be more attractive to investors. Thanks, Sophie. Robin, do you have a, a you know a momentary thought? And just and then we'll and then we'll go to Ron, and then just a closing remark from each yeah. of you. Well, we're a little bit different in Washington State. We have a platform that doesn't allow us to fund a lot of private investments. Our constitution doesn't allow that, so we have to work around different things. Um, to do that, but I think in the future, our, we'll have more opportunities, and I love what Sophie was saying about um, investments and, and how maybe you look at investments a little bit differently. We try to invest in smaller companies as opposed to bigger companies. We, we do have a certain fund that we can use, and we assume that the larger companies have more institutional investments. But for the things we're talking about, and to Ron's point, yes, we saw a lot of money in the last three to six months thrown at urban air mobility, advanced air mobility, which will probably all be electric propulsion, which is great if you have the amount of electricity that's required, you can get the infrastructure there. But for some of our other areas that are more legacy, we don't see that. So. I'm hoping to draw some, um, maybe some ideas or concepts from what we've talked about today, you know, to see if we could do something a little bit different. Thanks, Robin. And Ron? Yeah, maybe very, very briefly on this topic, because there was a question which I, I think uh, I'm, I'm obliged to take a look at, which was in the chat. And, I, and, I, and, I, and it's a very good question. So I would like to uh, you know, kind of be able to carve out maybe a minute or two on uh, on that one. But uh, I, th I think the mantra of the European Commission uh, is um, you know, public intervention hey, is where the market fails. It should not be where the market can take uh, care of itself. Maybe start, start that call. We can talk a little. Okay, the call here get lost. We need some great help in the Sorry. I'm... Got uh, some noise interruption there. Apologies. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Uh, let's see. It seems to have cleared up, Ron. Sorry. Carry on. Okay. Um, I, I'm not not sure w whether anything got lost, but you know the, the mantra is we we in, the public intervenes, the EU intervenes, and then member states intervene. Otherwise, member states have a, an issue with Brussels in terms of you know, state aid law, as it's called, where the market fails. And I think where the market fails is where you just you know you see twenty to twenty five years before there's a, a, a even a remote chance of a return. That's the kind of thing where capital will go to different markets. And I think we all want to still be flying in twenty fifty. So there is a case for public intervention. And clearly, there are different philosophies, and as, as Sophie rightly said, in terms of uh, carrots versus sticks, 
you know, I have a lovely job because I only deal with carrots, but there, I can assure you, there are people in the European Commission that are thinking about sticks with respect to aviation, and we all need to keep that in mind. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that said, maybe the question on the scope clause or on the, uh, or on the, on the market, if that's okay with you, Katie, because that, I think was the one you were asking, uh, to consider. Yeah, I think there was, well, there's just a question about, um, the regional market and yeah, whether, yeah. whether, whether actually there is a, is a strong enough market in that regional space. And I think, I think the assumption was that you were talking about the hundred seater market as opposed to the 150, 200 seater market, where obviously there's an absolutely booming. Or you could say that, yeah, you could say that of helicopters, you could say that of yeah. sub commuter or commuter level. Uh, I mean, each has a market which could actually be a very profitable or, or a very you know, uh, generate a good return for, for a business. But these businesses will operate at different top lines. You know, Boeing's top line will be different to the, the winner that, that, that succeeds in urban air mobility. Uh, uh, it is true, and we look at this through the lens of what is the total climate impact of aviation. Uh, and there, the regional market as it is currently uh, operating is probably around 5%. Uh, but the thing is, we think that we're going to see breakthroughs in terms of technology there, that once that gets up the learning curve and it proves itself, it's going. To, we're, we're either going to see the market changing in terms of its network. We're going to see more people being willing to fly out of smaller airports on smaller yeah. aircraft or we'll see that technology scaling up into bigger aircraft. Now, the thing is, we, you know, we operate in a world with a lot of mindsets, paradigms, even regulations that aren't always um, conducive to change. Uh, you know, the, not, up to 19 seats, no cabin attendant. Above that, cabin attendant. That's why you generally see after 19 seats, the next higher aircraft is 70 seats. Uh, there, there's, there's not much in between. Uh, the Fokker 100 was a wonderful technical aircraft from you know, from a country that I was came from and, and, and worked in, but probably 20 years too soon because in almost you know, the, in, in the largest markets, it ran foul of what was called the scope clause. I think one of our challenges is you know, to kind of lose the baggage, right? To drop this this ballast off 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 board reserves deviating. Uh, there are many things that we need to rethink in the policy and the certification and the regulation area. Uh, airlines in terms of contracts that will will or will not support a different way of um, of, of operating. Uh, finally, sorry, I'm 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 not trying to monopolize time, but single aisle aircraft. I mean that, that's the backbone of the aviation industry. Ninety percent of flights are below one thousand miles. Eighty percent are even below five hundred miles. These darn things are designed for between thirty seven hundred and four thousand miles. Yeah, up until very recently, every airline, every leasing company, every manufacturer would tell you, we have to because they need to be used, you know, one day to San Francisco from Boston, the other day from, from Boston to Washington. But if the system is 50,000 single aisle aircraft by 2050, I refuse to accept that they all need to be designed to exactly the same standard. You know, we, we, we have to rethink a couple of things. That's amazing. Well, I'm pretty sure we are straight out of time because Dominic has reappeared to, <laughs> to, to remind me. Um, but it's been really interesting talking to all of you, and I'll be interested too to see if any transnational collaborations emerge after this call between the EU, Washington State and the United Kingdom. Um, so, Dominic, shall we draw it to a close there? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Katie. Brilliant stuff. Yeah, so we're running a little bit over, so we will quickly yeah, segue into our next panel. But it was interesting to hear Sophie talk about that this isn't just an aerospace challenge, and uh, you know we need to think about the other, the energy market, and how that kind of plays a role. And we've heard throughout the, the course of this day uh, and yesterday so much around the infrastructure side. And so 